Hey, this has been a pretty eventful week, right? There's been some things happened this uh, last week or last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, Tuesday, not too long ago, there was something that happened. You remember what that was? Oh, the election. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> uh, no, it was actually the, the ceasing of unrelenting political ads, <laughs> which we all celebrate. Amen? <laughs> Amen. You know, I, I, uh, I got a, a Facebook post from one of my relatives that, that said, you know, uh, waiting for the election return. She posted on Tuesday night. She said waiting for the election returns is, is like uh, uh, when you work on a group project in college. Uh, or in high school. You remember that? She said, I, I know I did my part, but I worry about you all. <laughs> uh, that, well, that happened this week. Some other things happened this week. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, and, and what? Florida. <laughs> yeah, Florida is going to happen forever. <laughs> That's not going to change. Uh, but uh, something happened today is Veterans Day, right? Uh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, oh, there's something happened on Saturday. Let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, it's had something to do with Rifle High School. Uh, they went to another playoff game. Uh, isn't that cool? Eight years in a row that they have been to the playoff games, uh, and unfortunately, they lost. <laughs> it, was a, it looked like a pretty close game. Uh, I believe it was 21 to 14. In the end, uh, so they represent. Actually, we had quite a few schools uh, from the Western Slope that was re represented in the playoffs. A lot of them. Uh, I, I would say, I, I, I gotta be honest, none of them are <laughs> moving on right now that I saw. Anyway, but saw all the Aspen and so many different schools uh, that went. But I think it, they represented our Western Slope well, don't you think? Today's uh, Veterans Day. And really, there was an event that happened earlier this morning. It should have made the national news. It was probably one of the best events to happen all year. It had to do with Veterans Day to a, a degree. Uh, it, I don't know if it's going to make the papers. I don't remember seeing any reporters. But it, it was certainly the event that I'm going to proclaim. The visit of my Marine granddaughter. <laughs> she was here in the early service. I wish I could point her out and embarrass her some more. <laughs> she may never come back to church with me again. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a, a big event for me uh, to have my granddaughter here this morning, who is actively serving right now in the U.S. Marines. Uh, so I, I appreciate her. Well, so many things that are happening in our world. Sometimes things or happen that we don't like so much, right? I, I want to remind you that really we are living in this present day, in this present time, behind enemy lines. Now, when you think about it, the world is opposed to the things of God. As a rule, as a general rule, the world is, stands in opposition uh, to God. Uh, and because of that, there's a battle going on. Uh, there's a battle that, that rages. Now, we may not be aware of it, as much in our small little worlds, but across this world today, the forces of Satan are trying to make a difference for the bad. And the forces of God continue to stand for what is good. Amen? Amen. It's not like a Star Wars battle, you know, where the forces are almost equal. I just want to share with you with full confidence, as we look into the book of Daniel today, with full confidence, we are on the winning side. Amen? There may be a few skirmishes that don't go out, turn out like we want them to, but we are on the winning side. Our God wins in the end. Amen? Uh, and how wonderful news that is. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 8, if you would, please. Daniel chapter 8. We're going to be looking at, the, at some... Visions of the future. Uh, here is a different vision that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically today about the Antichrist, about the one who stands in opposition to Christ and the things of Christ that is going to appear. We're going to see a near fulfillment of this prophecy, and we're going to see a distant fulfillment of this prophecy. Not so distant to us, of course, 
not, not too far away for us to be able to see. Uh, remind you of this little chart as we go through it. Actually, what we're looking at, uh, where we are right now, this is uh, chapter two's uh, vision, uh, vision of the statue. We're in this period right here, church age, entering into this period here. We're looking at, if you could extend those feet on up, that might be where we're at right now, okay? Uh, the period of the clay and the iron feet in this statue. A period of, of a resurrected or a revived Roman Empire uh, in this period. This church age, we're going to talk of next week about 70 weeks and, and what that means, 70 weeks and 70 weeks. Uh, but here we're in this area right here where we can't really tell exactly when these times are going to happen, right? If I told you Jesus was coming back next week, would I be wrong? We don't know. We don't know. If he didn't, you could, you could bring rocks next week instead of the rotten tomatoes that you usually bring. <laughs> and stone me for being a false prophet. <laughs> We don't know how long this period of time is, but there is a period of time in between the 270 weeks that we're going to look at in Daniel uh, next week. Uh, but uh, we're in this period right here, the great parentheses, the church age, uh, as, it, as it speaks of. But we're going to be reading today about the vision that Daniel has in Daniel chapter 8. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we read uh, select portions of this passage? The vision itself, and most of the vision is included in the first eight verses of chapter one. We're gonna pick up in verse nine, and, and verse nine in the context comes after uh, Daniel has seen the vision. He understands uh, that there is a ram and there is a uh, shaggy goat. And these two objects in the vision uh, are what's gonna be explained to him. But out of the shaggy goat comes this tiny horn, in verse nine. Out of one of them, out of one of the horns, came forth a rather small horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to, ho to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth. It trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal to the commander of the host and removed the regular sacrifice from him. And a place of his sanctuary was thrown down. On account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? Will the transgression cause horror, or as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the Holy One will be properly restored. Uh, and then we skip on down, if you would, please. Gabriel's going to give an interpretation, but look down in verse 20. As he gives this interpretation, he says, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Median, and Persia. Shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn, which is between his eyes, is the first king. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from this nation, although not with his power. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgression have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and holy, the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart. He will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and the mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. 
And I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Father, we thank you that you, through your Holy Spirit, can help us to understand and be able to explain what you have shown to Daniel. As we look back on history, Father, we see how your hand has moved. We see how you have described the events that actually take place. Lord, as we look forward to the future, I pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts to understand what you're going to do in the future. And he which will oppose you, Father, we pray that we will be able to recognize so that we can draw close to you and receive power from you to resist his influence. Father, may you help us to understand what you're going to reveal in our not-too-distant future. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. So we have this description uh, of this vision. Uh, Daniel sees a vision in which the, the ram appears. Uh, and the ram is similar to the bear. You remember in the previous vision, the second beast was a bear. And it said that one side of the bear was higher than the other side. We, we said that could be the fact that the bear was moving forward and conquering, or it could be that one part of the kingdom became greater than the other. Well, in this vision, that's exactly the explanation. It's a different animal. Uh, here we have the ram representing the kingdom of the, the media, uh, media Persia kingdom, the Medes and the Persians. Uh, here we have the, the ram representing them, and they have, the ram has two different size horns. Uh, the one horn was longer than the other. Uh, and we find historically, because Daniel is writing this at the very beginning of that kingdom, we find historically that the Persian side of that kingdom grew and became larger than the, the Mede side of that kingdom. The Persian side grew to prominence and took over, uh, just as the scripture said they would. Now, Daniel was writing about these events before they happened, uh, and he describes this horn. That longer horn coming out last is the rise of Persia over Medes, over the Media kingdom. Uh, it is conquering, it says, in three directions. Uh, that The kingdom is expanding. It's bigger than the Babylonian kingdom. It's conquering more land than it did before. Uh, and in the previous vision, in the previous chapter, we learned that these kingdoms were left to exist for a while. And really what it means is they were absorbed one into the other. So the Babylonian kingdom became a part of the Medo-Persian kingdom. And then the Medo-Persian kingdom became a part of the Grecian kingdom that we'll study about in just a minute. But they conquered in three directions. It says here that the king did as he pleased. He did as he pleased. Uh, isn't that a good description of, of what happens when you get full of yourself, full of your own power, full of your own ability? And here, this ram seemed to be inconquerable seemed to, to do whatever it wanted to do until it meets up with the goat. <laughs> the Grecian kingdom arises. Uh, and it's interesting that Daniel actually identifies them as coming from Greece. Greece existed as a portion of the world, not in power, not in strength in Daniel's time. But he recognized that it was going to be the Grecians who arose. In particular, it was going to be Alexander the Great. He was... The, the one big horn in the middle uh, of this beast. Uh, and it says here, interestingly, that, that they, the, the male goat proceeded not even touching the ground. If you study history and you study about Alexander's conquest, he didn't hang around long. <laughs> he, he proceeded from one kingdom to another kingdom to another kingdom, conquering and conquering and conquering and conquering. Uh, and didn't bother about setting up any big uh, cities like the Babylonian uh, king did. Didn't bother about uh, establishing governments so much. He was just all into conquering. Remember last week we talked about how Alexander the Great <laughs> wept when there were no more kingdoms to conquer. Because that's who he was. 
He was a conquering king. Uh, and it says it has a one large horn. Now that large horn is Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great is going to die. He, that that uh, kingdom beat out the Medo-Persian Empire, took over the Medo-Persian Empire. It says in the, in the uh, vision that he trampled it. I can just picture uh, this big goat <laughs> just really pouncing on the ram until the ram is just completely smashed, completely gone. And that's what happened. The Greek took over the Medo-Persian Empire. He magnified himself. I don't know if it's a requirement for a politician to be narcissistic, but I think a lot do become that way, don't they? <laughs> it seems like power corrupts. <laughs> it seems like if you gain a few victories, you begin to think pretty big of yourself. You begin to think, oh, I am pretty great, right? I don't know if that's true. I haven't had that many victories myself, but, <laughs> but you understand what I mean. You can be filled with yourself, and certainly at this level, Alexander the Great was filled with himself. He magnified himself until the large horn was broken. Uh, you know, that's one thing about living. You will die, right? Ultimately, we all face the same thing at the end of our life. We don't know when that's going to be. I was sat in this week to hear about uh, a man that uh, worked for Mountain Air, uh, who, a young man. Uh, they called him Big over there. Uh, he passed away. I, I don't know what the medical explanation is, but it was complete shock and complete surprise. His wife, Rachel, works at City Market. If you see her, you might want to express your condolences to her. A young mom four kids now, I believe it's four, and doesn't know, I, I'm telling you, we all die. We may die when we're young, we may die when we're old, but the longest we live is nothing compared to eternity, right? Alexander the Great, as powerful as he was, maybe one of the greatest conquerors ever in the history of mankind, as powerful as he was still, his horn was broken off. Still he died. And of course we know uh, from our previous vision that the, the kingdom was divided into four generals who took over different portions of the Grecian Empire. And these four generals ruled their portion of the Grecian Empire. This vision uh, helps us to see beyond that. You see on the, the, the portion, uh, the Seleucus portion of the horn uh, comes a little horn. It's different from the little horn in some ways in the previous vision uh, because that comes from the great beast later on. That's a, a vision of the Antichrist who's going to rise someday. But in this case, here's a precursor to that Antichrist. We can even historically put a name on this person. Uh, this is, is Antichrist. And tickles. <laughs> tickles. You know, I, I looked this up in the morning. I did really good in the first sermon. <laughs> and tickles. <laughs> that, that'll have to work. <laughs> After this sermon, I'm going back to the computer <laughs> and pronounce it again. <laughs> it has left me. Uh, aren't you glad you come to a church where everybody's imperfect? <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> the small horn grew towards the east, and, and, and really what it says in particular it grew towards a beautiful land. Now, to Daniel, what was a beautiful land? Of course, to Daniel, it was the homeland. It was, how many of you are from Colorado? All your days in Colorado. Uh, the rest of you, the rest of the people here, have some erroneous, distorted view that there's someplace better than Colorado. Can you believe that? I mean, they have this homeland out there. They think, whoa, well, that's the best place. That's a beautiful land. But we know it's Colorado, don't we? <laughs> 
to Daniel, the beautiful land was Israel. And this small horn grew towards the beautiful land, expanded. This, this rule in this fourth part of the kingdom grew towards Israel and began to do some things to deceive the saints in Israel, began to deceive the Jewish leaders. Uh, Antichicus was uh, a leader, the fourth was a leader uh, during the period of time uh, that we don't have recorded biblical history, the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can read about this time, we can read about his rules, his rule in secular history, and we can see the near fulfillment of what Daniel is talking about in this man, this king called Antichicus. He deceived the saints. And here it says he caused some of the stars to fall. Ultimately, he trampled the saints. He was an anti-Semite. He's someone who believed that all good Jews needed to be eliminated. And ultimately, he tried to destroy the kingdom of Israel. He tried to destroy them, and it, it kind of backfired on him. He claimed equality with God. He took the title Epiphany, uh, which uh, would, is a title that says that he is his own God. He is like God. Or he is the God, is what he would say. Uh, he took that title. Uh, he, he replaced the sacrifice in Israel. And he began to do whatever he wanted to do. Ultimately, he even destroyed the rebuilt temple. Or even sought to destroy the temple. Uh, he eliminated the sacrifices. He eliminated the religion. He took over. He was an anti-Jewish or anti-Semite or perhaps even an anti-God leader. Would you say that? In history, uh, he was that. Uh, he destroyed the temple itself. In Daniel's explanation, he says that Israel was delivered into his hands because of their sin. Because of their sin. Because of what they had done wrong. Wrong. I want you to note with me that Antiochus lived about 400 years after Daniel. About 400 years. So he's talking about future events. He's warning the Israelites before they even leave Babylon. Remember, they were to be in Babylon for 70 years. And then they were going to go back and rebuild the temple. And they were going to go back and rebuild the city. Uh, they were going to go back and reestablish the nation uh, with permission from Cyrus. Uh, and he is, within that time, warning the Jews as they're getting ready to go back that that time's going to be over because their ways haven't changed. Because even though they go back, they still disappoint and ignore and rebel against God. And because of that, God's judgment is going to come in the form of this king, this Grecian king of a part of a four-part kingdom that has not yet arisen, Daniel predicts 400 years before these things happen that it's going to happen this way. And guess what? We know from history that it happened that way. Exactly that way. Uh, isn't that kind of telling for us? If Daniel could predict what was going to happen in 400 years, when Daniel speaks about what happens beyond the 400 years, do you think that we can rely on that? I mean, if we can see it lived out in our history books exactly like he said, do you think maybe we can believe that it's going to happen when he talks about an antichrist that's beyond Antichrist? Do you think maybe we can believe that as well? You see, the antichrist is coming in our world today. And we get some clues uh, from this passage. Antichrist and the antichrist are both symbolized by a small horn that grows. Remember in Daniel's previous vision, in, as he described this beast with ten horns, and there was one little horn that rose up in the middle of them, that it plucked out three other horns? Have you paid attention to the news this week? Do you remember our president was over in France? President Marcon, Marcon of uh, France... Uh, said something a little strange while he was over there. 
He said he thought the European nations should build their own army to protect against three evil powers, or three big powers. And he named those three powers. You remember what those were? China, Russia, United States? The United States. What, what does it say? I, um, this is just speculation. Right? I'm not trying to predict. I don't want you to bring stones instead of rotten tomatoes next week. <laughs> This is just speculation, but remember in the previous vision, the little horn plucked out three of the other horns that stood against him? I wonder if we're not in a precursory stage to that lit rise of the little horn. I don't know when the Antichrist is going to show his face, but I don't believe it has to be very far in the future. I think it could well be not too long from now. I see this war stage being set for the end time matters. Uh, both of these visions describe a little horn that grows. Both of these visions describe a small beginning, but a large and influential end. Both these horns uh, have an imposing look. Both Antichicus and uh, the Antichrist uh, are both said. In, in this passage, it says he has a stern uh, face, a stern face king. Uh, and in uh, the Antichrist, in, in chapter 7, verse 20, says he has an imposing look. Really, those are references to uh, the uh, kind of cruelty and harshness that these men will eventually display. At the beginning, they look like saviors. But by the end, they show their true colors and the cruel and the harshness. It says that Antichicus was a master of intrigue in, in verse 23. Uh, and the brilliance of the Antichrist is suggested by the eyes of the horn in, in chapter 7, verse 8 and verse 12. Uh, there you can see that, that this is an intelligent man uh, by the wisdom of the world. Both these descriptions... Uh, seems to indicate that the Antichrist will have wonderful solution to the world's problems. Right? Isn't that coming as we read Revelation? The Antichrist will be seen as a savior. Antichrist was seen as a savior in his day. The An Antichrist will be seen as a savior in his day. Both of them will have interesting and, and seemingly right solutions to world problems. Uh, the Antichicus had a great power, great power, but it wasn't his own power, this passage said. It was power inspired by Satan. We certainly know that's true in the Antichrist case, don't we? His power is directly attributable to Satan. Uh, when you think about it, here's, here's some passages you might want to think about. In Second Th Thessalonians 2.9 it says, that is the one, the, this man of lawlessness, that is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. When the Antichrist arises, he will do all kinds of fantastic things. <laughs> You'll be th thinking that, that Hollywood has a new special effects director. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, he'll be doing miraculous things, according to Revelation. Revelation 13, 2 says, The beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. Pretty imposing. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Who's the dragon? Satan. And Satan will give the Antichrist his power, and he will impress. It was in verse 7 of, of, Rome, of Revelation 13, it says, was also given to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. In other words, the only people who won't bow down and give authority to the dragon would be those Christians whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. He will fool 
to everybody else. With the great power, the miracles, the everything that he does, he will have great power, but it is satanic power. There's power from the wrong side. It will look good to begin with, but later it will yield its fruit of darkness, yield its fruit of despair. Antioch, Antichicus destroyed thousands. The Antichrist will destroy millions. Antichicus persecuted the saints. Uh, both of them begin by prospering. Both of them begin by looking like they have the solution. But both of them prosecute the saints and persecute the saints. Both of them will seek to destroy God's children and God's people. Don't be surprised that the world doesn't like Christians. We are behind enemy lines. Don't be surprised. Ultimately, I hope we're out of here by then. <laughs> that Antichrist stands against Israel and the children of God. Uh, he will persecute the saints. Uh, he was a deceiver in the beginning and he will continue to deceive. He painted himself in bright colors. He was a, a wolf in lamb's clothing. Don't you like that picture? I uh, found that picture. I thought, boy, that's, that's what it's going to be like. You're going to look at him, you're going to think, he's got all the answers. Isn't he wonderful? But ultimately, that side of him is going to come out that will seek to kill and to destroy both raise themselves to Godhead status. Both Antichicus and the Antichrist will raise himself and call themselves God. Both of them will even blaspheme God. Both of them will blaspheme God. It's interesting, the Antichrist, or Antichicus called himself uh, God manifest, Epiphanes, but uh, the Jews called him Epip Epipomenes. Epipomenes means madman. <laughs> they changed the name just slightly when he wasn't listening. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would be like to blaspheme God? I, I, I want to advise you this morning, if you are tempted to, don't do it. Don't do it. Both of these guys face a, a terrible end because they took God's name, they took God's character, they took belief in God and they blasphemed the God they should have believed in uh, and because of that ultimately they both were killed without human hands isn't that interesting Antichicus as we uh, find from a secular source uh, that was written by the Maccabean family which is a Jewish family that fought against Antichicus we find from that source that he died in Elymas after receiving words that the Jews had revolted. He died in defeat, seeking to destroy the city of Elymas, and then ultimately he received word. Not only did he lose that battle, but he was also losing the war because the Jews were revolting. And the Maccabean uh, revolt resulted in a short time when Israel was once more in charge of their old nation for a short time before the Romans came in exactly according to what history said would happen. Daniel predicted these things before they happened. But Daniel also predicted some things beyond these things. When he says that he will stand against the prince of princes, what do you think he was talking about? There's no historical character for that until you get to the time of Jesus, who is the prince of princes, isn't he? He is the, the prince from the heavenly kingdom. He is God's own son in line to the throne. Amen? And the prince. And here the Antichrist will stand against Christ. That's where we get the title, Antichrist. He will be uh, the one who will stand against Christ. Oh, it's true. Uh, Jesus said many Antichrists will arise. And we see many of those in the world today, right? Many people standing against Christ and against the Christianity. That's why we live behind enemy lines. But there will come a man who will be the epitome of those who stand against Christ, who will be empowered by Satan to do great signs and wonders and to fool many, many, many people. 
will appear to be the Savior for about three and a half years. And then we'll reveal his true colors in the second three and a half years. I believe it's coming. I believe it may be soon. Now, it's interesting that he was, Antichicus did not die by human hands. He didn't die in battle. He died on his own. God said it was time. The Antichrist will also not die by human hands. Have you read the book? Have you read the end of the book? Do you know what happens? We win. <laughs> Amen? Amen. We win. I mean, we may be in some skirmishes right now that we, the future looks pretty bleak, or it looks like we might be losing, but I'm telling you, the end battle is already won. You know, I'm struck by this. You know how many angels it takes to cast Satan into hell? Can you imagine? Have you ever watched Star Wars? You see how the battle is always in question? Who's going to win? The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always, you're wondering, well, what's going to happen next? Uh, this bad guy's going to turn good. This good guy's going to turn bad. And it looks just really like the bad is almost winning all the time. That's not true. And the real cosmic battle is occurring. There's never been any doubt about who's going to win. There's never been any doubt about who has power. You know how many angels it takes to cast Satan into hell? Just one. By the authority, by the power of the holy God, it only takes one. He is a defeated foe. That's why he's causing so much ruckus. He knows his time is coming. That's why he's doing all he can to take as many people with him. Let's not let him win the battle in our lives. Amen? Let's not let God, who could inspire one angel to cast him into hell, can defeat him in our lives as well. We wrestle not against human flesh, but our battle is against Satan. We know who can win that battle, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, working in our heart. Christ. Amen? We have hope in the midst of that battle because the power isn't in us, because the power is in him. And as we let him fight the battle with us, we do our part, but we let him fight the battle. Ultimately, he's going to win. Amen? No doubt about it, folks. No doubt about it. God wins. Satan loses. Antichrist is defeated. But he's going to rise. He's going to cause as much trouble as he can in the meantime. We need to keep our eyes open according to Jesus. We need to be prepared. We need to put on the armor and live for Christ because it matters. Now think about it. It matters to us. How long will you live? day you were born to the day you die. How long is that? For some we learned this week, it's very short. But I'm telling you, even if you live, I, I did a couple funerals. One a funeral I did recently was for a man who was 92 years old up in Oregon. 92 years old. Do you know how long that is? I don't have to move my finger very much. Display the difference. Do you know a decision that I make within this amount of time affects all of this amount of time? Do you know what I do with Jesus Christ within my lifetime, however long it is, affects all eternity? I need to make sure that within my lifetime I decide to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And once I do that, I need to look around my family, my friends, other people that God has put me in contact with, and make sure that they make, within their short lifetime, a decision that will impact all of eternity. Amen? I mean, that's my job. I don't mean as a pastor. I mean as a Christian. I mean, just like you, that's our job, to go into all the world and make a difference for Jesus. Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever. 
I believe that water ought to be stirred every week as we approach these end times, don't you? And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us telling people about Jesus, fighting against the ways of Satan. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we've studied today. We thank you for this great vision that Daniel had, this vision that reminds us that the end times are coming. Lord, that, that you will appear. And when you appear, that we who are yours will join you forever and ever. And those who are not yours will face, unfortunately, the consequences of their decision to reject you. Lord, I pray that you would help that to, to impact our lives and our hearts so that we will be your witnesses, so that we will share with everyone we know, everyone you bring into our contact, Father, the, the good news that you have given us to share, the gospel. Father, I pray as the Antichrist is about to arise, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would have full effect in our lives and in the lives of those that we love, that we care about, those that, that we meet, those that we're around, Lord, that you might enlarge your kingdom before the end. Lord, I, I believe the only reason you're tearing is what you've said in, in Peter, that you're not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And so, Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful witnesses of yours until that time. We would see more and more people come to know you, come to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen.